Hello, and welcome to another riveting episode of Get Your Tech On, your go-to show for all things Doxis. Today's episode is titled, Your Questions, Our Answers, SNR, RxMER, and Doxis 3.1 modems, sort of the theme. It's going to be a special one. We'll be diving deep into your listener queries about Doxis, RF issues, and the intricacies of the HFC network. I'm Brady Volt, founder of The Volt Firm, and I'm thrilled to be your host as we explore these complex topics. Also, backed by popular demand is our esteemed expert, John Downey. CMTS technical leader at Cisco Systems, John brings a wealth of knowledge to the table and is also ready to help us navigate these complex issues and do all the heavy lifting because he certainly has the muscles for it. Well, except for his calves. <laughs> so buckle off as we unravel the mysteries of SNR, RxMER, and DOCSIS 3.1 modems. Welcome back, John. Let's get started. That's a sick burn right there. <laughs> burn. <laughs> Do my best, John. So uh, I had to, uh, I wanted to give you props for you and uh, Ron Braddock doing the uh, back, uh, did you know? Yes. I always enjoy trivia and things that you thought you knew, but maybe you didn't know it that well. Or you thought you knew time, really well and didn't know it all. I know. <laughs> Which I, I, I got a bunch of out of that one. Like I can say one thing and Ron can say it a different way and then it clicks for somebody else. Like yes. it just, you need to hear it differently sometimes or different analogy or something like that. You know, I thought it was a, a, a really good uh, presentation you guys put on. Did you do part two already? No, part two is coming up uh, July 16th. I have it uh, at the end uh, of the show notes. I'll be letting okay. everyone know when that episode is coming up, but it's coming up soon. Um, just a couple, uh, I want to let everyone know we have a big thunderstorm just about to roll in. So if anything happens and our, we go dark, we'll make up for it and redo this again next time. And also please do subscribe and hit the channel, uh, hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes, everyone. So thank you for that. We'll, we'll blame it on the Canadians. Uh, fox <laughs> yeah, I get creating all kinds <laughs> of storms for us. Easy everywhere. So, so John, um, yeah, so today we're going to be taking answers from our question. Yeah, we'll be giving answers to people's questions, but not taking answers, hopefully. Um, so everyone, uh, you know, please log in. And if you have questions for today, drop those in a chat room. Otherwise, we'll be uh, taking uh, or answering some questions. And the first one we have is on reboots and forward er error correction. So Carlos... Uh, wrote in, and his query is, what is the ideal time after a modem reboot to check for uncorrectables on each locked frequency, and, and what number indicates a problem on, on that type of modem? So, John, I thought we'd, you know, just kind of set the stage for everyone, talk about forward error correction, what's an uncorrectable, what's a correctable, what do these type of things mean, and we'll get into the formula as well about even how you calculate correctables and uncorrectables and, and how does that impact the modem? Um, I'll toss that over for you, John, because I, I know you want to dig into that right away. So let's, should we assume we're talking upstream? Um, well, you know, it's, you know, we have uncorrectables in both the upstream and the downstream. Right. Typically, yeah. the upstream is more impactful, but you can have them yeah. on the downstream, right? It can impact yeah. you there, too. Yeah, yeah let's, and let's assume DOS is 3.0 and 2.0 with single carrier qualm for now. Okay, let's start let's there. Let's start talking about DOS 3.1 of DMA. Um, forward error correction is uh, Reed Solomon, you know, two guys that came up with the in invention of forward error correction. I think we use uh, even bit arity, even arity bit or something like that, where mm -hmm. you put all the bits kind of lined up in a row. And, and when you uh, do a cross matrix, uh, if those don't add up to an even bit, then something's wrong or whatever. You, you have an error. <laughs> yes. So what's interesting, though, is if you have a bunch of, symbols we'll call frequencies that represent digital data and i have a, a one cycle that represents zero zero one or one one zero whatever if i have a spike of ingress come in and take out um a bunch of bits right next to each other the error correction is not very efficient right like it can't determine is there an error like if if two ones turn to two zeros, then I still have even bit, even bit parity. <laughs> so two wrongs make a right. <laughs> so you, like you You're able to detect that error then. Yeah, you can't detect it. So when you add AWGN, additive white Gaussian noise, random noise, 
you have a lower MER, but you have random bits that go bad, and forward error correction can figure that out. So forward error correction is very good at correcting, and then we call it correctable FEC. Right. It corrected the problem because the logic figured it out. But if I have impulse noise and think impulse could be 10 microseconds or really small. Very bursty, very the short. Of things, we send bits, million bits per second, right? So one nanosecond could be a bunch of bits in a row. Yes. So even though you think it's short in time, it really isn't short in time when you look at the bits. Yeah. So forward error correction doesn't work well with impulse noise. So I told people, it's like uh, correctable effect, it's correcting it. So I'm not worried about it, but it used to be a rule of thumb was if correctable effect is getting really bad, it's going to turn into uncorrectable eventually. And start to impact and you. Problem. And that's when your yeah. voice starts to break up, your video starts to break up, or if you're a gamer uh, and you go to shoot someone, you get shot. You, you miss the <laughs> shot and, and it, you know, everyone starts to complain and your data speeds start to slow down. And, and that's when you start so, to call here. We're trying to set a baseline here, what effect is and how it works. And the question was... Um, when should I track? And I would say, let's think about the upstream. I know how mob profiles work because that was my bread and butter. I've done mob profiles for 20 years. And I know the bursts, the IUC 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is for single carrier qualm. Um, IUC 3. Initial is ranging. Initial ranging. And in that mob profile, there is FEC T bytes. So there is overhead for FEC during initial ranging. And what's interesting about initial ranging is that's contention time. So if you have a power outage in a node and they all come on at the same time, they all have initial ranging that, lo that locks onto each other or overlaps, you're going to get an uncorrectable FEC all over the place. Yes. So here's the case where you shouldn't track uncorrectable FEC, not just for that one modem, but for the whole service group yep. and make sure things are stabilized before you start tracking. And then that was part of the question was, you know, when's the ideal time after a modem reboot to look at uncorrectables? So um, to your point, if there's a power outage, you may not want to look at those uncorrectables right after that modem's booted up. You may want to you may want to wait and 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 do a reset on the counters on that modem to look at it. And many times you might be looking at the upstream like show cable hop is one of the commands I use. It shows upstream correctable, uncorrectable, but that's not deep inside each modem. That's for the whole upstream. Right. So I'm going to make sure all my, there's no modems in a NIT R1. Once a modem gets to a NIT R2, it's doing station maintenance. A NIT R1 is that initial maintenance burst. Once right. it gets to a NIT R2, it's a unicast station maintenance, which is IUC 4. four. Correct. Yeah. So that one shouldn't have collisions because it was timed. Assuming your time offsets are good, which that could be a bad thing too. And by time, you're okay. meaning the CMTS is controlling the transmission of every cable modem. So the cable yes. modem's transmitting it in its own mini slot, not colliding with any other cable modem. Correct. Correct. So let's let's back up and say, all right, we're going to track per modem uncorrectable FEC. And I'm not going to worry about the whole upstream. As long as that modem is, you know, past its initial ranging, I guess, NIT R1 and NIT R2 and NIT RC, then it starts going into a NIT D. Now it's going to do DORA, Discover, Offer, Request, Acknowledge. Right? That's my mnemonic. Yes. I love That's your DORA. That's my mnemonic, <laughs> right? DORA. So once it gets to a NIT D for DHCP Discover, now it's going to start using short and long bursts in the mod profile. Um, if I'm getting uncorrectable FEC there, that's a problem. Yes. And it might be I didn't get any uncorrectable FEC at a NIT R2 and NIT RC because station maintenance mob profiles are usually like 16 qualm. Very Whereas robust. Whereas when you get the short and long burst, they're probably 64 qualm. Not so you so could robust. have an MER that's hovering around 20, 20 dB that the maintenance of the modem will work fine because yeah. 16 qualm. You're not going to get any errors at 16 qualm at right. that MER. Yeah. But then you get to a NIT D, it starts using the short and long burst that are 64 qualm, and it might not work at all. Yes. So and that's the area goes up. Where it's not just uncorrectable effect, but you get modems stuck in the registration process and they're not getting past the NIT D. And the other problem with the NIT D could be it's not an MER issue. Try to ping your helper address to make sure you have access to your DHCP helper. That's a network, network layer, layer issue. Yeah. You can't ping your DHCP server. 
Yeah. Right. Okay, so that's DOCSIS 2, DOCSIS 3.0 modems with the fact. We'll, we'll get into the calculation of it in just a second. Um, but let's talk about DOCSIS 3.1 modems because they use a different type when you're using OFDM and OFDMA channels. Don't they use a different type of error correction, John? Yes, yeah, so like LDPC, low density parity check. Uh, I know you did a great little uh, explanation of some of that on one of the other uh, podcasts um, talking about and maybe it was the one we did locally, right, in Charlotte. Yes, yes. I might, yeah, I think yeah, that was that was a, that was a yeah. Piedmont chapter that we talked about. Yeah, I talked talk about, about LDPC and, and how it's so much more effective and and powerful than Reed Solomon. Right. And it was invented a long time ago. It was 1963 by Dr. Gall Gallagher, yes. We didn't have the processing power we have today, right? Yeah. So... Now we have silicone and the processing power to do all kinds of computations. And now it's something someone thought of 100 years ago is finally coming to fruition. So amazing. Yeah. They came up with these yeah. algorithms when they didn't have computers to come up with these algorithms or even yeah. use the algorithms. Yeah. Only now yeah. can we use them because we have the silicone processing to do it. Yeah. So, yeah, it is, I mean, LDPC is an amazing algorithm for error correction. And it gets us within 3 dB of what's called the Shannon um, theorem or Shannon limit. And, and Shannon limit is like close to, well, Shannon limit is like what we can do that's theoretically possible. It's like perf perfect. And, and we're 3 dB within being the you know, perfect capability of doing something. So that's LDPC. It's an amazing error correction al algorithm. It just keeps processing and processing and processing those errors until it eventually fixes them. So it's, <laughs> it's an amazing algorithm. Yeah, yeah it's, and, and, and on a side note, you know, this is not at zero expense. Yes. Like on the upstream, if you put in more effect T bytes into your mod profile, you're putting in more overhead. Right. So if that overhead, if you do small Ethernet frames and you look at the DOCSIS six byte header and your effect T bytes and all this extra overhead and guard band and preamble, all this stuff that goes into a mini slot uh, or a burst, um, it could be 50% overhead if you're doing 64 byte frames. That's a lot Easily. of overhead. I did not yeah. realize the overhead was that high. <laughs> but if you do 15, 18 byte Ethernet frames, the biggest frame you typically could do, then that percentage ends up being closer to 7% overhead. Right. I thought it, it was interesting to me. I, I read up from Broadcom years ago when I started at Seacourse, man, a long time ago, um, how if it's not a one to one linear relationship, meaning if I add more T bytes, do I go from 3 dB robustness to 4 dB robustness? No, it turns out that 7% overhead was almost like a sweet spot where I would break about 3 dB lower on my MER than I did before, meaning I was 3 dB more robust. But if I went to 14% overhead, I would only gain like a half a dB more robustness. It's not worth it. That's a yeah, that's, that's exactly. too much of a trade off. You're getting you're yeah. just wasting too much overhead for that just half of a dB robustness. Exactly. No one's exactly. gonna know. <laughs> yeah. So some people are like, oh, let me manipulate my mod profiles and throw in as much spec T bytes as I poss possibly can, but at the expense of what? Right. Speed. Right. So with LDPC, um, so we talked about correctables and uncorrectables with DOCSIS 2.0 and 3.0. And like, well, uncorrectables, we're not so worried about because that really doesn't impact the end users. No, it's the correct. I'm sorry, correctables yeah. we're not worried about because that doesn't impact the end user. It's the uncorrectables. Does that hold the same for DOCSIS 3.1 with LDPC, John? No, it's because it's um, because of the fast forward transform, FFT. I believe also maybe because of time and frequency interleaving that mm -hmm. happens on DOCSIS 3.1, um, you could easily see 100% correctable and you would think the sky is falling, chicken little, sky is falling, <laughs> and it's perfectly normal. Right. So once DOCSIS 3.1 came out, we quickly told everyone, hey, don't track correctable as an indication of a problem with your plant. Right. And then we went with their Viavi and other test equipment vendors that, hey, don't set up a red flag when correctable is above 10 percent because it's going to be red flag everywhere for three one. Yeah. So don't don't so don't get it. too concerned about correctables yeah. with OFDM and OFDMA channels. But with SC QAM channels, our legacy QAM and DOCSIS 2.0 and 3.0, and you also have 
um, SE qualm that a DOCSIS 3.1 modem could be locked to. When you see the uncorrectables starting to go up, the correctables, wow, I'm really reversing this, the correctables starting to go up, that's kind of a leading indicator that your uncorrectables will start to go up. And just uh, to go back into the slide here to explain how uncorrectable code words and correctable code words, like if, if you're not familiar how these are calculated, it's, it's pretty simple. You can look at the total code words that you have uh, and the total correctables or uncorrectables. Here I'm just showing how correctable code words. So you take your total correctable code words, divide that by the total code words, multiply by that by 100, and that's going to give you your percentage. And then we just, I did a quick example here. So we have um, 760,804 correctable code words. We have like 1.3 million, I think that's 1.3 million um, cor total code words times 100, and that gives you about 5.49% correctable code words. Now, 5.49% correctable code words that's really not going to have any impact at all to the end subscriber because they're correctables, which means yeah. the, the either the modem or the CMTS, whichever is the receiving device in this case, it's seeing that there are errors, but it's able to fix those errors. Now, if these were uncorrectable code words, so if that was you know, 760,000 uncorrectable code words and 1.3 million um, total code words, and that was 5.49% uncorrectable code words, that's definitely going to impact the subscriber. And generally, the rule of thumb that I tell people is once you hit about 1%, that's going to start to cause the voice to break up a little bit. If you're like on a, you know, on this type of a call, like we're doing a YouTube video yeah. or in your Zoom call, Skype call, something like that. If you're a gamer, it's definitely going to impact your gaming performance. And it's only going to get worse as that starts to go up. When you start to get like 5% uncorrectable code words, your voice can start break up. Like, and you're not going to be able to hear what the other person is saying. It gets really, really bad. And that's when you're going to have your subscribers starting to call into the call center and saying, hey, my inner, you know, I can't hear my mom when I'm talking to her. Um, and, and that's, you know, kind of the rule of thumb that I generally tell people. I don't know if you if you give people a different advice, John, or do you see the no, typically I mean, same I, thing? I have settings for what we call advanced spectrum management. And uh, the default for uncorrectable FEC as a threshold is 1%. So I leave that as a default and leave it. Some people would argue, can I make it half a percent? I'm like, we only do um, whole number increments, so we can't do a half percent. Right. So I leave it at 1%. But correctable... I actually set my threshold for zero on correctable, which disables correctable as a threshold uh, criteria because I don't want to use correctable to dictate a frequency hop or modulation change right. because really the bottom line is uncorrectable. And if that were the real bottom line, you might say, well, if uncorrectable is what affects my customers and quality of service, why not just track uncorrectable? Here's the problem with that is, impulse noise you could have impulse noise that makes uncorrectable go through the roof because the forward air correction can't fix it because it was impulse noise it's so you have no correctable at all you have uncorrectable but because it's impulse noise the mer looks fine yes so i tell people to track mer and a logical boolean end with uncorrectable so that you're not having false positives or because if it was impulse noise you want to change modulation because it would have to change right back again because it was impulse noise right it just comes and goes. And even if you change modulation, impulse noise is so high, the lower modulation is not going to work either. Yep. So I shouldn't have changed modulation. I should have just stayed and just waited out because the impulse noise will go away or whatever. Yeah, so it's sometimes like there's different problems that cause different reaction to MER, correctable effect, uncorrectable effect, misses in the flap list. I mean, there's all kinds of little yeah. things that I can track for troubleshooting. Okay, well let's uh, let's take a moment. We um, John Don has joined us back in the chat room. So Don, thanks for joining. He says hi. It's Don. Question for you: If Doxus 3.0 has down RX max that does not pass, what does that mean? So I think um, it's down RX max power. I'm um, assuming is what I Don think, is I asking. Think, What's I that? Think, I think he might say MER maybe. Don. RX okay. MER. Yeah. R no. RX MER okay. maybe. That yeah, does not pass. So, so that's so. So we were talking about DOCSIS 3.1 modems. This I think he's is meaning RXMER. So if the RXMER on a DOCSIS, oh no, he said DOCSIS 3.0 modem. So it can't it can't be uh, that. So RX RX Max does not pass. Um, 
Well, Don, Don right back to us. <laughs> get back to us. Clarify your question and we'll answer that. What do you mean? Do you mean max power? Do you mean MER? What do you mean on the max for that? We'll get back to your question on that. But there is no real max downstream power. It'd be more like a min downstream power. Yeah. You know, we for downstream power, we want to hit between, I say, minus 5 to plus 5, even though the specs is minus 15 to plus 15. I think it's safer to shoot for a downstream receive power closer to zero plus or minus five. Right. And then it'll be safer for distortions and power level issues and converting to DOCSIS 3.1 later where you might need to be a better power level anyway. Yeah. And if you're talking about MER 3.0, um, obviously it's not sub carries, but the whole carrier has an MER reading. Um, the highest modulation you do is 256 qualm. And we know that's going to break around a 30, 32, four, some, in the 30s, somewhere in the 30s. Well, for 256 qualm, I, I think the minimum is about 31. We'd normally, but we always say go up to, add some padding to that and keep it around 33, 34 so you don't hit that, yeah, yeah, hit yeah. that break point. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, okay, so Don says, sorry, RX max or min value? So I, I think he's... <laughs> he's MER just, or power? Yeah, power M level? Power level or are you talking about SNR, MER? Yeah. Like... So, well, he'll get back to us. All right. So the next question we have um, is from a listener named John. John, I'm assuming this is not coming from you, but John asks, how does a signal to noise ratio SNR impact the performance of DOCSIS 3.1 modems and what range should we consider acceptable? So signal to noise ratio SNR, you know, we very, we, we frequently interchange SNR with RXMER, or when we're talking about DOCSIS 3.1 modems in the OFDM channel or OFDMA, it's going to be RXMER per subcarrier. So, John, there's a, you know, this is kind of a lot because we get a lot of different measurements when we talk about RXMER, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the downstream, we can uh, plot out the MER of all the subcarriers and do like a graph, and then we can see the graph. And we have something called profile management, at least Cisco CMTS. And some people might use PMA. Um, profile management application. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Because <laughs> uh, we, have, we have PMA, and, and, um, and that's, that's something that you can also use separately from the CMTS. And, and it does much a better job when you use it separately, John. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, you know, I think the PMA makes sense if we start going higher modulation than 4K qualm. Like, if the modems do come out with the option that was in 3.1 spec that no one actually has yeah. of 8K and 16K qualm, with a remote phi solution, I think PMA would really, would really benefit, the higher modulation would really benefit from PMA. Right. Right, right now I have uh, profile management in the CMTS, so I don't have to rely on an outside source. Yep. Uh, that works pretty well because most systems, node plus one, node plus two amplifiers, they're getting a decent MER and if I'm doing remote five, I'm getting even better MER. And I've had a lot of systems running 4K qualm. So now, so so let's um let's talk about so I, I let's put the slide back up um real quickly here, and let's talk about why you know what the thresholds are, why we need PMA, and 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 the different modulations that we have in an OFDM channel. And so what I'm showing here in in this slide is there's multiple downstream modulations, 4096 qualm. 2048 qualm, 1024 qualm, 512 qualm, 256 qualm. So these are all possible modulations that could be sent simultaneously by the CMTS on the OFDM channel to the cable modem. So the cable modem could be receiving all these modulations and, and potentially use these different modulations depending on the amount of impairments that are on the OFDM channel. Now what we have to determine is what are, and, and this goes to John's question, not you, John, the John that's asking the question, um, what is the required RXMER? He's using the term SNR, but I, I kind of want to encourage people to see, understand, really we look at this as RXMER per subcarrier in the OFDM channel. You know, what's required for the modem to be able to use 4096 qualm or use 20, 2048 qualm, et cetera? And, and John, I'll hand it off to you because you, you know, when we were reviewing these slides beforehand, you talked about what Cable Labs recommends as the, the requirements for these different modulations. So you have, a, you have a pass, marginal, and a fail. And it turns out 
the pass you have is 3 dB lower than the Cable Lab spec. So if you look at, there's a table uh, in the cable, the multi-spec, one of those specs, a 3.1, and it shows, let's show that table again. Yeah. Uh, for 4K QAM, it's 41 dB. For 2K QAM, you know, 2048 QAM, it's 38. So it's, what you have for a pass is actually 3 dB lower than what the table in the spec says. Yes, but I do. But the table in the spec <laughs> is 6 dB more conservative than we know where it breaks. It, it actually, well, it actually LDPC. works. It works yeah, in the well, field at these levels. Because yes. of LDPC and because of time and frequency interleaving. Um, so though that robustness in DOCSIS 3.1 OFDM uh, will make 4K QAM work all the way down to like a 35, right. which is pretty impressive. So to give yourself some headroom, we're telling people as a recommendation, you know, maybe the cable lab spec is too conservative. You could set your threshold 3 dB lower than that so that you're not dropping down modulation for no real reason. Correct. So what you have for pass, I agree with, 38 for 4K QAM. I think that's perfectly good. But remember, you're not getting a 1 MBR reading for the entire 192 megahertz block. <laughs> your OFDM is 192 megahertz. Out of that 192, it's like 190 megahertz of yeah. active subcarriers. It's a really yeah. wide channel. So yeah. at the low end of the channel, you could be at the 38, but at the... At the high end of the channel, you could be at like 12 if you, if you yeah, have a lot of okay. tilt or plant roll off. So there's a lot of things that happen with that yeah, channel. The carrier roll off at the high end, you could have uh, uh, a micro reflection causing a standing wave inside the yeah. entire 192 megahertz block. Uh, so yeah, you could have different MER anywhere within there. You know, when we were doing single carrier qualm, it's only six megahertz wide. It's one channel at six megahertz wide. We get one MER reading for the whole thing. Well, now we have all these little subcarriers. So we're getting MERs for every single subcarrier. And, um, and and so getting back to your point, that's why PMA is so valuable. You could have really high MER at at the high at low frequencies. In the mid range, your MER could drop off really low because you could have LTE interference. And then at the higher frequencies, your MER could go back up, but maybe it's not all the way up at 38 dB. Maybe it's at uh, say 32 dB. MER, RX MER, where you could support 1024 QAM. And so what PMA does is it analyzes every single one of those subcarriers. And there could be like 4,000 subcarriers within that OFDM channel. And then PMA will adjust the CMTS so that at the lower frequencies, the modem can run at 4096 QAM. At the mid frequencies where you have that LTE, the modem will drop down to 256 QAM. And then at the higher frequencies, where you're down to 32 dB RxMER per subcarrier, the modem will run at 1024 QAM. So PMA, it doesn't fix the impairments, but allows your modem to run at the optimal speed at different frequencies throughout that OFDM channel. And it does the same thing for OFDMA as well. You know, when we were first starting this out, we were just explaining how my neighbor could run one modulation, I run a different modulation. But we're talking about, it goes even deeper than that. I could be running different modulation in my burst anywhere within that burst. So like you said, I could be doing 4K QAM on the subcarriers that can handle it because the MER readings, and it might be doing 256 QAM at the very high end because of high end roll off or water right. and attack or whatever. So yeah, it's uh, more complexity, um, but with more complexity, we get more speed and more efficiency. And that's why we start looking at maybe external uh, machine learning, uh, yes. artificial intelligence, all kinds of, more processing power outside the CMTS to make decisions. Yeah. All right. Um, getting into the chat room, there's a lot of activity going on here. So I want to catch Peter Vittman's uh, comment first. It's, I can't express enough to fight uh, against the urban legend that correctable code word on SCQAM without any uncorrectable code words has an impact on the user experience. Some people think this raises too much CPU. Um, so I think that's an interesting point Peter makes that and, and John, you made this point too, particularly with RxME or with LDPC, that LDPC uses a lot of processing power. But even Reed Solomon, when when you're doing a lot of error correction, you are using CPU. So I, Peter, thank you for that input. That's that's an interesting point that you make. Um, John, any thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of that fact uh, computations is in silicon. It's yep. in the hardware. It's not CPU intensive on the CMTS. Now, whether or not it's more CPU intensive on a cable modem, I don't think it is either. I think it's, 
I think it's in the silicone. I think it's in the chipset. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not external to the chipset doing more computations and having to talk back and forth. Um, so my understanding is it's not creating more overhead in the form of CPU on the entire system. Right. Like this MTS. If I were to run this show CPU process, process show proc CPU, which means show process CPU, you see the processes in the background running like SNMP. That's a killer one. I was gonna say SNMP yeah. is probably the biggest killer, both on modems yeah. and CMTSs yeah. that uh, is out there. <laughs> when we, particularly yeah, when SNMP. we have a lot of monitoring systems pulling uh, correctables and uncorrectable statistics. A whole midwalk of the entire CMTS. Yes. From different people, and they don't, and, and you know, left hand's not talking to the right hand. It's like, man, who is logged into this box? Yeah. There's like five people pulling the same information. <laughs> So, yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, so, local trees, glad to see you out there. Um, Neville asks, what are the causes of downstream uncorrectable errors? Wow, that, so there's a lot of causes. Um, I, mean, I mean, typically, so John talked about, you know, burst noise, noise that can get in there. Um, it, it's generally noise signals that are going to get in there and impact the modem, anything that's going to distort that. Um, John, other causes that you want to add? So we talked about impulse noise causing problems, and one of the things that helps make impulse noise errors look more random is interleaving. So we have different levels of interleaving on the downstream. We typically stick to 32.4, 4, uh, interleaving. It's like taking 32 customers and taking four bytes from each one and putting them in front of each other. So you're interleaving the different packets. Uh, So whenever a burst of noise comes in and then you de-interleave those packets at the modem, that error looks like it was spread out. Right. You know, but so why don't we just interleave like even longer, have a really deep interleave so we don't have to deal with any of these errors. Then then you end up with more delay and there's that causes problems with uh, jitter and latency. Yes. And when we were always we were talking about trying to get jitter and latency less low latency doxes, for example. Yeah, so, so you asked about what causes uh, downstream uncorrectable effect. I mean, it could be noise, enough noise that the interleave and the forward air correction can't fix it. So it turns into uncorrectable. Could be just a spike of noise. It's not even impulse, but it's just always there. A yeah. ham radio or some type of uh, downstream, like you said, LTE, you know, long. Uh, Anything on the air that gets on the coax on. network? Yeah, it's going to, yeah. and, and it's the same frequency as your DOCSIS channels? It's going to cause errors. <laughs> so. I mean, it could be a micro reflection causing a big suck out in the middle of a single carrier qualm or somewhere uh, that has low enough MER right at that. It's causing an uncorrectable effect. Right? Yeah. All right. More questions are coming. Um, so Dawn's coming back. So the downstream channels, DOCSIS 3.0, down RX min value, minus 17.5, fail, question mark. Why down RX average, minus 11.7, fail down SNR min 30.5 fail. So I think he's talking about why is that when downstream channels have a low value, are they failing? Um, so Don, on, on that, you know, we want the input level to the modem. Um, so that's receive level. We want the ideal input modem, ideal receive input to the modem. And John had mentioned this earlier to be right around zero dBmV plus or minus Ideally five, we can go plus or minus ten. But when you start to get to around, you know, minus seventeen point five dBmV into that modem, you're going to have really low signal levels into that modem. So the modem's going to have a difficult time demodulating those signal levels. You're going to have low MER, and then you're going to start to get those uncorrectable code word errors just because the the modem's really challenged. It's, it's going to be you can think of it as a very noisy environment. Your signal to noise or your carrier to noise. Um, ratio is going to be really low and your MER is going to be low. Um, so that those are problems. Um, that's why you want, you know, you want the signal level to be higher going into the modem. Yeah, and on the flip side of that, you, you could say, well, what if I have a high level, like plus 15, that should be better. Higher is better. <laughs> you're not just, you're not just going in with a DOCSIS channel on that coax is all your video, yep. all your DOCSIS, everything can overload that modem and cause distortions in the modem. So now those distortions turn into like composite intermodulation noise. So your MER could get worse because the levels are too high. 
Yep. So it's, there, there's a happy medium. It's kind of like if you turn the stereo all the way up and your speakers start to like just distort, distort noise coming out, it's the same way with a modem. If you put too much RF energy into the modem, um, just like when the RF energy is too low, you know, with your speakers turned down really low you, or your stereo is turned down really low, you can't hear the sound. Um, same way with your modem. If the RF level in your modem is too low, the, the demodulator in your modem can't hear it. Vice versa, you turn your speakers up real loud, it's distorted. Too much RF energy into your modem, the, the demodulator in your modem gets distorted. It, it cannot take that much energy, and now, you're gonna, again, you're going to get uncorrectable um, FEC, uncorrectable errors. Um, so, uh, so Peter says, uh, yes, he says, right, it's in the hardware on the tuner silicon part. So we've, we've dismissed that myth, Peter. Thank you so much. Your comments, uh, Augustine asks, hello, folks. I follow this channel for the past year. First time on live. Well, welcome. Welcome. Glad you have, have you on live. Please, please join back more frequently. Um, Dawn says, also, what is the code words upstream SC QAM channels frequency baseline errors, unaired delta, corrected delta, uncorrectables delta? Um, wow, I, 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 you know, I'm not sure what test equipment you're using or what monitoring <laughs> system you're using there. Um, but I think those are just more statistics that are saying, you know, here's your here's your correctables. Here's the delta from the last maybe poll or the last time we measured that. Um, John, I'm not sure if you're familiar with those. Hold, uh, hold that thought because I that was in my mind. I wanted to say that is if you track any type of counters, make sure you track from from scratch. <laughs> like counters keep I incrementing. Could have, I could have a million uncorrectable feck from a week ago, but I don't want to put that in my calculation. Yes. I want to say, all right, let's clear the counters and start from t0 to t1 yes because a week ago you may have had time. you may have had some impairments and today you have no impairments and and yeah, so if exactly. you're worried about these errors that you're seeing in your modem on your monitoring system you to your point if you're not tracking those over time like yeah. some time scale thing where you can see here's a blip of errors here's another blip yeah. of errors you might be worrying about something that's just not there right now it happened oh, it happened a long time ago yeah, if i look at just the, the counter and it says a million errors I'm like oh my god a million errors that could have been when the modem was coming back online, and we already talked about when it comes online, all bets are off. Yep. When it comes online, you could have all kinds of uncorrectable effects so it settles down and gets at least a pass in the RC. Correct. Absolutely correct. Um, all right, so we got that. We got some more time for questions. Our next question is the number of bottom channels of modem speed, and, and we had two people that asking very similar questions, Amina and Liam. So Amina was asking about how does the number of upstream carriers offered by an ISP like Spectrum's four upstream carriers influence the DOCSIS performance or the performance of a DOCSIS network. And then Liam was asking both about downstream and upstream. He said, how does the number of downstream and upstream channels in a modem influence its performance, particularly when considering upgrades to a newer version like DOCSIS 3.1? So, so Joe, go oh, ahead. Let's take it. Yeah, let, let's talk about the pros. I mean, it should be obvious, more channels, more speed. The modem can bond and spread its traffic. We call it uh, a wide band or spreading the traffic across multiple carriers. Uh, you should get more speed per modem, right? Uh, the more channels you offer into a network, the more people can share that aggregate pipe. It's distributing and, the data. Yeah. So if I say four upstreams, well, now that modem might be able to, that aggregate, when I do the mass 64 qualm, 6.4 megahertz wide channel, it's 108 megabits per second. 27 megabits per upstream, right? Yeah, per 6.4 channel width, 6.4 megahertz, with using 60, assuming 64 qualm. Right. So if I have 108 megabits per second aggregate, I could probably offer a 50 megabit per second service, no problem. I would nice. never offer 100 meg service from a 108 <laughs> aggregate. You're going to over, over utilize the upstream then. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can't really oversubscribe with a lot of people sharing something like that if each person can starve each other. Yes. You know, so. So I, I set my expectation and I said, all right, four channels is great. Now let's look at the con to more channels. The con to more channels will be the T4 multiplier. When you have four upstream channels, by default, this T4 multiplier, it's a the T4 timer is like station maintenance. Mm -hmm. Every every 30 seconds or so, the CMTS and cable modem, how you doing? I'm doing great, fine. It's a three-way handshake. T4, done. And this if is I where say, we get the T3 timeouts. This... I'll go into a fast mode say, hey, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? As a CMTS, right? And that's going to cause misses in the flap list. And that's not a good thing. And T3 um, timeouts. 
right? If, and if I yeah, the T3s, I can handle 10 or so in a row and it'll still be fine. But once you get a T4 timeout, the momentum's going to reboot. Yep. You can't afford a T4 timeout. So the, the problem with the T4 multiplier, and when we do four upstream channels, the spec and the industry recognize that I don't want to create more maintenance on my entire plant by saying, how you doing, how you doing, how you doing, how you doing, four times for this modem, and then four times for this modem, and then four times for this modem every, say, 30 seconds. Because now you're just using, you're congesting your upstream. It's still the same house. Yeah. <laughs> so if I, if I ask you how you're doing on one upstream, logic should follow that the other three should be the same deal. They're on the same. Closely the same. Thing, sort of, right? Yeah. So they said, oh, you know what? To eliminate too much station maintenance, let's do a T4 multiplier. You say, if I'm doing four channel upstream bonding, I'm going to multiply four times the station maintenance first. Now, from a CMTS perspective, when we do line card redundancy, we call it HA, we'll send out a station maintenance every 15 seconds. But if I multiply by four, now it's every 60 seconds. So if I'm a CMTS and you're a cable modem, I'm not going to talk to your each individual upstream except for every 60 seconds. Where in lies the problem is, what if you have an MER issue, you have a pre-equalization issue, you have a level issue, you're not going to get updates till every one minute. Yeah, which means so, when an impairment comes, it's going to take a minute to compensate, yeah, or up to a minute to compensate minute. for that impairment now, whereas yeah. before it was only taking 30 seconds to compensate, or 20 yeah. seconds to compensate for that minute yeah. impairment. So, more upstreams, more speed. More upstreams longer delay to get your upstream MER, upstream level, upstream pre-equalization. Uh, so those type of things right there take a little bit longer. So T4 multiplier. The other con to more upstreams is power level. When you do DOCSIS 3.0 extended power, whatever we call it, um, instead of maxing out at 51 dBmB, I think it maxes out at 54 dBmB, for four channel upstream bonding. Right. But the spec says if I do four channel upstream bonding using 64 qualm, the spec says each channel is 51. So if you if you had a 3.0 modem, you're doing single upstream channel and your house has a lot of loss and it's a high value tap, it has to go all the way back into CM test at zero and your modem is transmitting 53. And then you say, hey, I'm going to go to four channel bonding. It's it not going to happen. Work. Yep, you're not going to have the modem doesn't have enough power to add that fourth channel. Yes. So what happens then to the modem, John? So we have some little tricks and band aids to tell it the CMTS can have like a six dB window to say, I see you're not hitting me at zero, but you're within this window of zero to minus six. I'll let you stay online. Right. So I'll let you do four channel bonding, knowing that you're not hitting the CMTS at zero, you're hitting it maybe minus three knowing you're getting worse MER than everybody else that's hitting at zero, but maybe it's still good enough to work. Yes. And if it isn't, then we have other hooks to say, if the MER is bad, maybe we change your modulation. Or you drop the channel altogether. Yeah. Or you go to partial mode, where yeah. if a channel is so bad that the upstream channel is bad, maybe you say, hey, quit scheduling traffic on upstream three and just let that modem schedule traffic on upstream zero, one, two. Right. So it went to upstream bonding partial mode. So that's the upstream. Downstream, it's going to be the same. More channels, better. You can spread the traffic yeah, yeah. out over. Yeah, and I yeah. think also yeah. the same things. But what about uh, the T4 multiplier in a downstream? Does that apply? There's no such thing as a T4 multiplier because there's no T4 timer in the downstream for a modem. It's just a, right. it's an upstream parameter, T3 and T4. Um, let's think about that. The one thing I see problem on the downstream that's not on the upstream is spectrum allocation. Upstream, Finally. you don't have any spectrum. <laughs> upstream, they're going to be so close anyway because you don't have much spectrum. Yeah, smash them right together. Yeah. Downstream, if you put eight channels here and eight channels up here, that could be a problem. If the and Depending on the modem, through. right? Because older yeah. modems don't have the ability to lock to uh, DOCSIS channels on a lower frequency and DOCSIS channels on a higher frequency. And I've seen cable operators that do that. And I'm like, well, why won't the why won't the modem bond to all the channels? Newer modems, well, particularly DOCSIS 3.1, they can bond to mo channel channels modem. anywhere. There was a four channel modem. Then there was an eight channel modem yep. that only had a 96 megahertz filter. Then there was a eight channel modem that had two filters. So you could separate uh, four channels here, four channels right. here. Then they came out with a 16 channel modem, 24 channel modem that and then, then went full bandwidth capture. So then you could just 
put the channels anywhere you wanted. Yes. The problem with that still though is if I put 12, eight channels down the low end of the spectrum and eight channels on or whatever on the high end of the spectrum, you know there's going to be tilt yes. on the downstream channels. So that modem now has to bond across channels that are plus 10 on the low end and minus 10 on the high end. And now the tech is struggling to say, how do I get these channels into that plus or minus yeah. uh, zero, yeah. plus or minus five, plus or minus 10? And, and I, I talked to the cable labs years ago about that. I said, how much tilt do you think I could handle and bond without having issues? And they said, like, uh, if you look at the, the tilt in the FCC spec, for how much tilt you could have. Right. Adjacent carries is like 3 dB, and the tilt is, if you go from 500 to 600 megahertz, another dB, 600 to 700 megahertz, another dB, it's like 15 dB. And I think they said, yeah, 15 dB, we could still bond okay. What I don't like about having disparate frequencies for downstream is if those downstreams are primary capable, and I have a 2 ohm modem on a load balance from here to here, that's a big the jump. The are so different, the motor might go offline. Yes. But what, it'll go offline when it's doing its load balancing. Yeah. And, and you can load balance from one to another, and now it's like uh, my levels aren't good enough, so it just goes offline. Yeah. And for anyone who doesn't understand load balancing, that's the CMTS moving modems around when one downstream channel becomes congested. So it's quite possible if, if, you, if you have a situation like John described, where you have DOCSIS channels spread out, the debt DOCSIS 2 modem, particularly during peak utilization times, you 8, 8 p.m. at night, that DOCSIS 2.0 modem could be moving back and forth all the time, and that could be the reason that, uh, or even a DOCSIS 3.0 modem could be moving between bonding groups. That could yeah. be a reason that your modems are like flapping off and on um, during peak utilization times, or even on a congested downstream cha um, CMTS. So just something to think about, folks. Um, if we think that, and the second part of the second question was about 3.1, right? So if, if, 3.1 obviously is more efficient, more bits per hertz, um, more bang for your buck, more speed, more robust, uh, a bigger channel with all these subcarriers in it, uh, but you need a 3.1 modem to take advantage of it. Yes. And you have to allocate spectrum. So if you don't have a lot of 3.1 modems, you can't afford to allocate spectrum. Spectrum is a hot commodity. It's hard to find spectrum. You know, that's why we're trying to Rob Peter to pay Paul. We're stealing analog channels, trying to convert them to digital. So we open up spectrum for more 3.1 and 3.0 DOCs. So, you know, more 3.1, I think the better, um, but there's this inflection point of how many devices are out there that can utilize it. Yep. Right now there's talk, remember, remember at SCTE, you and I talked about the Pi modem? Yes. 3.14. How far can we push DOCs 3.1? Did, did yeah, did you see the Cable Labs, uh, announcement of they are going to call it 31 plus no i no, i did not hear that so they're they are actually going to push out 31 a little bit more yeah so they're talking more about, gas out of it we talk about four o modems could be esd extended spectrum doctrine doxis the 1.8 gigahertz and a higher split diplex voter or fdx one or the other yeah fdx allows overlap of upstream and downstream spectrum so there's no diplex voter in there which is kind of strange but you have to have echo cancellation some other funky stuff in the forum modem. It's a lot of tech in those you know what i talked about i was like what i really need is a 3-1 modem that can just do more bonding right more blocks because all the modems on the market today can do two OFDM blocks and 32 single carrier QAM for downstream. That's it. And up to 4K QAM modulation. On the upstream, they can do two OFDMA blocks and eight single carrier QAMs. Right. Up to, I think, 4K QAM as well. That's for upstream. But we're like, to get more speed and offer one, easily one, two, three gig on the downstream, I need a modem that can do bonding of four OFDM blocks. Right. So that's where we came up with the Pi modem, 3.14. Yeah. But they are going to call, I think, 3.1 plus or something to that nature. 3.14 um, was a much better name, John. I like that. <laughs> 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 Here we got Raspberry Pi and all these other computer thingies, whatever. We can just call it the, some other Pi, <laughs> Boston Cream Pie. All right, we can. Uh, we got time for one more question. I think this will wrap it up. We we can't go too deep in it. To but Bill seeks to understand how does the transition from DOCSIS 3.0 to 3.1 impact overall internet speeds and reliability, and what factors should we consider when making this switch? So I already mentioned spectrum allocation is a big consideration. Yeah. So and, and let's start with like the return path, right? I mean. 
right now most operators have a 42 megahertz return path europe has a 65 megahertz return but upgrading is from 42 to at least 85 megahertz if not 204 megahertz i think is something that everyone should really be considering because right now if you just have a 42 megahertz return you're going to be really limited in in what you can do just you know you're going to have a couple of SC qualms and maybe a really small OFDMA channel. That probably, to me, is is something that I would consider as a cable operator first. Like, how do I expand my return? Because I want to have a lot more downstream speed, you know, maybe gigabit per second. But if I'm offering give it gigabit per second, what am I going to offer in the upstream? Yeah, so if you want to offer one gig in the upstream, you got to do 204. I mean, that's all there is to it. Yep. If you're doing 204, you're probably going to do some type of remote Fi, remote Mac Fi, or some type of distributed access architecture so that you can have a good upstream MER from a digital link, not an analog link. Right. Um, if you go to 85 megahertz, you're doubling from 42 to 85. You can get quite good good speed. If you want to do a 42 megahertz and you have OFDMA and maybe two single carrier qualms, so you're kind of balancing out 2O modems, set-top boxes, EMTAs, that use 2O or single carrier qualms, and 3O modems that do two-channel bonding. All the 3-1 modems would have higher speed. You could offer a 100 megabit per second with that solution. Uh, that's basically the only way you're going to offer 100 meg on the upstream is if you do OFDMA and a couple single carrier qualms. Kind of like you're balancing out and still trying to satisfy the old modems and the newer modems. Um, so going to 3 1, going to get you more speed, but only 3 1 modems could utilize that spectrum. So that's the that's yes. the hard one, right? That's the hard pill to swallow is how many modems are taking advantage of this. But even if it's only 10% of the modems, they're your heavy hitters. So taking those heavy hitters off the less efficient single carrier qualm and moving them to a more efficient OFDMA can actually help your 2.0 and 3.0 modems that are still stuck on the single carrier qualm. Yeah, because now there's a huge amount of capacity that you just moved off of those single carrier qualms and yeah. put on the OFDM or an yeah. OFDMA channel. Yeah. And if you go from four channel upstream bonding to two channel, you just gain 3 dB in your max power too. So yeah. maybe if you have power level issues, you actually gain some back by going that two channel upstream bonding for the 3.0 modems. Yeah. Now, now, because you mentioned distributed access, access architecture, where you are eliminating the analog portion of your network and you are sending all digital data analog from the optical, CMTS. Analog optical, yeah, the analog optical. Portion. Yes, analog optical. And, and so from your head end or your hub site to the fiber node and your fiber node becomes a, a digital fiber node or an RPD, remote PHY device, um, I think an important thing to mention that operators should be aware of is you're no, it's no longer possible or no longer easy to send your analog signals to that remote PHY device. So you start to have to thinking about, okay, how do I get my traditional video from the head end or hub site to, my, to the rest of my plant, to the subscribers? And it's not, and it's not just video, right? It's test equipment. It's, yeah, it's, uh, a, leakage it's leakage test. equipment, so it's yeah. a lot of things. Yeah. But it, I've, I've, so yeah. operators that I've worked with, this was like an aha moment to them. Like, wait, what about my video? How do I get my video to the subscribers? I have to go to IP video, or I have to come up with other solutions that that specific vendor um, may have that's different than what I've been doing. And to your point, John, test equipment becomes radically different. I may have to change out all the test equipment I have or migrate to different test equipment solutions because that test equipment is no longer able to be sent over the the analog network. It now has to be all IP based. Um, so that becomes things that I think oh, everyone oh, needs to take into take consideration. Let's take a step back. If your video is digital MPEG-2, that can be generated in the RPD. Yes. So it's not IP video at that point. IP video is MPEG-4. Right. Now, if you transition the head end to get rid of all the video qualms, and you get rid of MPEG-2 qualms, the set the set-top box, and you go IP video, now you can do IP video over Doxis itself. But once you make that transition, it might be easier and easier to justify going pure pawn. Like some people it's, might say, once I do a complete head-end overhaul and I'm IP video, there's Pawn no might be the best way to go. <laughs> Some, yeah, it it, it, it really pawn, depends right? on the market. It yeah. really, really depends on a market how much market too, right? we how fiber deep you already are and how much more fiber you have to push. So and, and how, how quickly can I get it out there and and that last couple hundred feet in the yard? <laughs> that might be the hardest part. 
<laughs> so, yeah, so other things you may want to consider, I mean, we mentioned test equipment, we mentioned um, um, that you're going to be changing out your, probably your analog equipment and uh, analog transmitters, receivers, and going to a digital network. But um, with all that, you also have your whole IP network in your head end because everything has to be very low latency to support. Now what's going to, you're going to have PTP timers. Uh, PTP clocks, I'm sorry, um, that's going to be supporting this network. So everything becomes now very precision oriented from a timing standpoint. You have to have low latency um, for all your switches. It's going to be connected in your head end. So these are some of the things that I think that become. And that's for DAA. And yes. the question really even wasn't DAA. Really. It was more DOCSIS 3.1, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> I knew we, we went a little bit too far. But if you were just talking about 3.1, there's no need to go to DAA. You, you don't have to, correct. Yeah, so you could be doing DOCSIS 3.1, no problem. Uh, downstream is just finding the spectrum to do it. Um, knowing that DOCSIS 3.0, single carrier QAM, the last frequency you can select is 999. Right. 999 megahertz. That's why the spec says 1,002 Two. megahertz, so 1.002 gigahertz. Uh, DOCSIS 3.1 goes to 1.218. So Correct. it gives you just enough spectrum to do an entire 192 megahertz block in the upper end. The problem with that is sometimes Mocha, I think yes. this C channel, I think it's a C channel. Uh, it, 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 one, it interferes with, with that 1.2 gigahertz that you can use. So you have to start looking for subscribers that have Mocha. Make sure that's not in their home. If it is, you have to address the Mocha issue. And then also make sure it's not leaking out of our home, their home. Mm -hmm. A nice thing about DOCSIS 3.1 modems is they do support full band capture up to 1.2 gigahertz. You can use that full band capture capability in DOCSIS 3.1 modems to find those homes that are leaking Moda, Mocha or have Mocha in it. And we do that all the time. Yeah. So. That's a nice capability in them. Um, so quick uh, jump back into the chat channel. Um, Local Trees, thank you so much for supporting us. Everyone, You can the best way you can support us is by communicating to your friends um, who are in the industry about our channel. Our main goal is to provide education to the channel. We want to do that free to everyone. Um, that's, that's our goal is to get this education out there and Definitely subscribe and, and uh, get the information out to everyone. So appreciate everyone's support. Appreciate everyone's questions. So was there one more or was that it? Uh, that's what we have time for because we're at the top of the hour, John. So All this right. brings us to the end of yet another enlightening episode of Get Your Tech On. Um, hope you've dived into some questions that people enjoyed and try to cover a broad range of topics. Um, again, our aim is always to just unravel some complexities of DOCSIS and HFC networks. And I hope we have done that. I hope we shed some light on the topics today for all of our listeners. John, a massive thank you um, for bringing all the depth of knowledge that you have today. Your expertise to our discussion is always greatly appreciated and your insights are invaluable. Really What's appreciate the everything. Well, the, the saying is you can't fool them with facts, baffle them with BS. <laughs> <laughs> we try to do a little of both on this show. <laughs> so, and, and of but, course. Uh, I, do, I remember, and maybe the next session we can go over. I remember the things that we put off were partial mode. Uh, modems go into partial mode. Yep. And MDU wiring and MDU infrastructure. Wiring stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I think we could probably make a whole session out of partial mode and what to look for. Yep. Because Absolutely. modems have a certain capability, but they register lower than that. That's a problem. Yep. If a modem registers in full capability, you know, all its downstreams, all its bonding, but then has problems go to the partial mode, how do I know? The, how am I alarmed or warned that's in partial mode? And is it doing 23 channels of downstream now or one channel? Like what, what level of partial mode am I really doing? Yep. And to make matters worse is we bond at the service flow level. So technically a modem could register in 24 channel, but one of the service flows could be using a single channel like voice. Yeah. Absolutely. We purposely don't want voice to bond across all 24 because it's a very small, slow flow. So we have a command to say, put the voice over the primary downstream. Right. That way there's no... It's not spreading it across yeah, and having yeah. to recombine it afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks, John. And, and also, thank you for all our viewers and thanks for tuning in asking questions in the chat room. We really appreciate that. And thanks. I have a stack of questions still to go through. If you want to submit a question to us, you can submit it to info at the Volt Firm, um, and we'll 
info at volpfirm.com. Got to get the whole email in there. So really appreciate to everyone who submits his questions, both on a chat. You can drop them in, a, in the uh, uh, in the YouTube comments below. Love the comments. So thank you, everyone, who does that. Um, the community is awesome. It, it really keeps me invigorated and everyone invigorated. So it's, it's just great for everyone. We love your enthusiasm and your curiosity. It makes all these discussions possible. So please remember to subscribe to our channel, hit that notification bell so you don't miss future episodes of our show. We've got plenty more interesting discussions lined up for you. We will be back on July 14th with a marvelous Ron Rannick for part two of Did You Know? Part of our Back to Basics series, so don't miss that. And until then, keep on learning and so long. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Yeah.